After the Alaska Lands Act passed in 1980, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologists continued efforts to determine distribution and abundance of marine birds and mammals on offshore islands along the new Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge coastline. In 1980, a chartered flight from King Salmon, Alaska dropped off U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist Edgar Bailey and me, volunteer Nina Faust, and our gear on a beach at the head of Island Bay inside Jute Bay. We would be traveling by 16-foot inflatable boat with two motors west to Amber Bay and then back to Chignik, a distance of about 200 miles. By 11 p.m. that night, we were shuttling equipment, motors, gas cans, and food out to our boat, nearly a half mile offshore to catch the tide. By midnight, we were at Jude Island. Rocks, reefs, and rough water on the south side forced us to land on a rocky kelp-covered beach. We were looking for nocturnal seabirds like storm petrels or ancient murlets during our nighttime hike, but found none. We only found gulls, cormorants, puffins, and oyster catchers here. By 3 a.m. we camped, but left the next morning to make camp behind a sand spit on the mainland. That night, near the tent, I encountered a brown bear about 30 feet away. A blood-curdling scream brought Ed yelling with gun in hand. Luckily, the bear ran away. We crossed Portage Bay with six-foot swells, but no wind. Entering Wide Bay, just around Cape Igvac, a 30-knot northwest wind blasted us. The anchor fell off of the bow in the rough seas, wound around the prop while spray was filling the boat. We managed to land on a waterless unnamed island amid hundreds of harlequin ducks. Wide Bay is over 20 miles wide and very windy. With an acceptable wind level the next day, we surveyed seven islands on the east side of Wide Bay. We found few seabirds and three bald eagle nests. Bears have torn up all the islands near East Channel Island. With another northwesterly storm, we camped on East Channel Island and then explored the island the next day. We saw 40 sea otters, but little else. We tried to move to another island, but the high winds made getting a fully loaded boat off the beach impossible. With the boat full of water, we gave up. Next day, we landed on West Channel Island. Later, at Terrace Island, we saw a brown bear and discovered a jeer falcon nest, an unusual find. We explored two unnamed islands and then Hartman Island, where we saw two more brown bears on the beach. Three windy days later, we motored out against a 30-knot wind and headed to the next island. A few red-faced cormorants were nesting on offshore rock stacks. We found four bald eagle nests that had been destroyed by bears. Most of Agrippina Bay's many islands had been ravaged by brown bears, leaving few surviving seabirds. We made the run out to Ashiak Island, planning to camp. A brown bear sow with a cub changed our plans to camp on shore in a protected little cove. We anchored offshore in the cove and rearranged our gear to sleep under the boat tarp for three hours until daybreak. On June 27th at 4 a.m. we headed to David Island where we base camped in an idyllic cove with a freshwater lake above. From here we surveyed Navy and Poltava Islands. Both had very few birds. Rock formations are very different on these three islands. Poltava's magnificent double arch is big enough to drive a boat through. Bears are able to get on all three islands, again, effectively limiting birds. We surveyed Port Wrangell by boat and then explored a narrow fjord which terminated at a river and tidal flat. We picked up our fuel cache in a nearby slough where we saw millions of small jellyfish and fish fry. David Island is a beautiful hiking island with tundra and massive rock formations. While packing up the David Island camp, a brown bear ambled past me to the beach. 
Shooting flares and yelling did not phase it. As I carried a load to the boat, the bear started swinging its head, huffing and bouncing its upper body. We quickly shoved off in the unloaded boat and buzzed in circles in the cove, banging on a pot. Finally, the bear left. Our late departure meant the 12-mile run to Chiganagic Bay took us till midnight. Here, we saw a sow and two cubs on the crest of the ridge above our planned camp. We landed on the beach, set up camp, and built a huge bonfire. By 3 a.m. we were in the tent. Two nearby islands we visited the next day had no nocturnal seabirds. One had a huge kittiwake colony of about 7,000 pairs. Bears had been all over the islands. The following day we explored all the islands in the upper bay. We again observed extremely heavy bear sign, including huge excavated sections of the bank where burrows had been. Back at camp, a bear had been by, so we built another big bonfire. The next day, we ventured out to the Iugnac columns, where we saw about 500 sea lions loafing on the rocks around the columns. We had planned to camp on an unnamed island, but a bear was there and had been digging up puffins all over the island. Most of the hundreds of burrows had been destroyed. We moved to an unnamed island near Central and Hydra, where we set up a base camp near a dilapidated fox farmer's cabin. On July 4th, we motored four miles over to Hydra Island. Hydra and Central had about 7,000 tufted and horned puffins. We camped on Hydra hoping to document nocturnal seabirds. In the very dark hours of the night, we heard rhinoceros auklets flying. Ed found a burrow and was able to dig one out to confirm nesting. Nearby Central Island had a difficult beach and the only campsite was on top of a swale above the beach. About 150 red-faced cormorants were nesting here. At 11 p.m., fork-tailed storm petrels started calling. Clouds and drizzle created a perfect dark night for nocturnals. Later, we heard a few leeches, storm petrels, and ancient murelets. So many fork-tailed storm petrels were flying that when I stood on a rock near the tent, one hit me in the head. On July 8th, we moved to Garden and Eagle Islands near Amber Bay. Eagle Island had virtually nothing. Garden Island had just a few puffin burrows. Here, we revisited some of the islands we had surveyed the year before, boating 35 miles to Nakchimak Island. As we passed Kumlik Island, we encountered a brown bear swimming from an offshore stack back to Kumlik. A fast-moving front with high winds forced a rough landing on Nakchimak Island, where we stayed for three days waiting for the weather to improve. On the fourth day, we forged through 10-foot tide rips and miserable chop to Hook Bay. With calmer winds the next day, we headed across Chignik Bay to Castle Cape, an impressive geological formation. It is a castle guarding the enchanted fjords Castle Bay and Northwest Bay. Sheer waterfalls cascade down smooth rock slabs into the ocean. A humpback whale spouted several times in the serene waters of the fjord. The next day, July 15th, we hiked to 2,800 feet near the top of the ridge above camp. Sharp, angular talus made the climbing difficult and dangerous, and fog kept obscuring our view. Finally, we followed the shoreline around to Chignik in Anchorage Bay, where we would catch a flight back to King Salmon. We waited four days for a plane to pick us up, but finally a plane arrived to take us back to King Salmon, where we could catch a flight back to Anchorage on Revolution Airways. <laughs>